This is BER. Often imitated, never duplicated. The original Elvis Express Radio. For the fans, by the fans. Ah, uh, hello there, Nancy. We're back. Fourth hour, special hour of Elvis Express Radio's Elvis Request Show. And our request is one big one. It's part one of our three-part interview with uh, the wonderful Mindy Miller, uh, interviewed by our very own Joe Crine. And so uh, it's coming up for you in just a minute. Joe, what do you want to uh, say? Mindy is a sweetheart. You know, Mindy was with Elvis for three years. I think she was like 22 years old. And she was absolutely gorgeous. Yes, absolutely. And, yes. And I can't say this about other people in Elvis's life, but she still is. She is a gorgeous woman, nice woman, pleasant to talk to. I think she's going to be friends with EER for a long time, certainly with me. She wants to say and talk about nothing but good things about Elvis. Well, that's what we want. That is that's what right. we want. And regarding looking like other people, at least she doesn't quite look like a plastic doll like certain other people. That's right, exactly. Mm, not naming she names. Like Mind- There's one thing about Mindy I also got to give her a lot of credit for. When she, she doesn't want to talk about other people, put other people down, even if she dislikes them, she just doesn't do that. And I think that's great in this Absolutely this world. good on her. Well, you know, Mindy, thank you for doing this for the show. And um, here's to uh, a good friendship with Elvis Express Radio. Uh, we really do appreciate what you're doing for us. And um, I can't wait to hear the proper interview. Well, get it started, Mindy here, Miller. Here it goes. Hey, I'm Joe Crine from Elvis Express Radio and Elvis2001.net. And I have a girl here with me today, a friend of mine, who a lot of people don't know the name very well in the Elvis world, but it's Mindy Miller. Hey, Mindy, how you doing? I'm doing great, Joe. Thank you for inviting me on your show. Oh, it's it's great to have you here. And uh, you're a great Elvis fan, and uh, you have wonderful stories about Elvis. Uh, let me t- let me ask you a little bit about yourself. Where were you born and raised? Um, I was born in Los Angeles, California. I actually grew up in the San Fernando Valley, and uh, I was adopted at birth. Okay. What kind mm-hmm. of music did you like? Well, you know, at the time I was growing up, um, it was rock and roll. So, I mean, you know, at five years old, I remember watching Elvis on the Ed Sullivan show, like many people in my age group did, and he just knocked us out. I mean, we had never heard or seen anybody or heard any kind of music like this anywhere before. So this was a whole new sound, it was a whole new beat. So growing up with his music, I I loved rock and roll. You know, before that, in my mom's time, they didn't have rock and roll like that. They had the Jimmy Dorsey bands. They had the big bands. Uh, they had jazz, you know, things like that. But they didn't really have rock and roll and Bobby Soxers, which is, you know, the 1950s. Um, then, of course, in 63, 64, the Beatles came out. Then it was the whole England scene that came over from the Dave Clark Five, the Turtles. Um, Rolling you know, Stones. <laughs> the Rolling Stones, Petula yeah. Clark. You know, you had all these, this Mary Quant kind of, uh, we called it the England or English invasion. So the music that I grew up with was very much that of, of uh, rock and roll, the Beatles. And then, of course, um, who came along wasn't really rock and roll, but it was a different kind of music, were the Doors. And that was a whole other kind of, of music, you know, and I remember that in... in uh, 66, 67, 68, I actually remember going to a club called the Hullabaloo Club mm-hmm. in Hollywood here, and um, my girlfriend and I got in, and we literally stood, we were the first ones at the middle of the stage, the stage uh, came up to about my chest, it started at my chest, and looking straight up above me, I watched Jim Morrison sing, Come on Baby, Light My Fire, oh. and it was the most incredible thing because I realized even at that young age and I must have been 15 or 16 I realized at that young age the history that was being made by this man and his group Um, and yet it wasn't rock and roll it was another kind of darker kind of music but that was catching on so it was in a very eclectic time of all these different kinds of music coming up and taking place that I grew up with Mm -hmm. But but you were an Elvis fan uh, from the beginning then. Very young you were an Elvis fan. Um, here's the thing. I was not a fan, which okay. which which is, is interesting. I liked him. 
but I wasn't a fan in the sense that I took his pictures and pasted them on my wall. Right. You know, I was I I grew up in a time where it was surfing. We we had the Beach Boys too. I forgot to mention that. So the Beach Boys and the surfer music was really big, and I was more into that than I was anything because the Beach Boys were very California beach uh, um, music, and so. I was at the beach all the time. I played hooky from school. (laughs) You know, my girlfriends and I, uh, we bummed rides off of the kids that were older, that were 16, that could drive. We were 13 and 14. And so we were going to the beach, and it was that Annette Funicello, uh, you know, Frankie Avalon, Troy Donahue, Connie Stevens. Um, It was that time where... I was attracted more to the blonde, blue-eyed surfer kind of guy. Sure. So as much as I loved Elvis um, as a singer and I saw his movies, I only had maybe 245 records at the time that my mom had bought me. One was Blue Hawaii, and the other one, I don't even remember what it was. So I liked him, but I wasn't this fan. I became a fan, literally, after knowing him and after realizing what he had done for music and all the different kinds of music. So I wasn't necessarily a fan before I actually met him. Right. I loved his music, but I was more a surfer girl. <laughs> right. Now, did you ever? Yeah. See, I mean, you you met. I mean, you didn't met. You didn't meet him, but you saw the Lizard King, uh, Mr. Morrison, yeah. and then an, another icon that you get to meet, Elvis Presley. Did you ever in your life think that you were going to meet Elvis Presley? Not when I was growing up. I did not. But. I had uh, gone into modeling and acting at a very, very, very young age. And after being adopted, um, I found out that my, both of my parents, later on in life I found that out, were both in the entertainment industry. My dad was known as the bullwhip man of Hollywood, a big character actor, and my mom was an actress, singer, and dancer. And they met on a set, on a movie set in Hollywood, and uh, fell in love, and... um, had me, but I was given up for adoption for various and sundry reasons, so I never knew that they were in the entertainment industry, but growing up in the, uh, you know, uh, in the entertainment business, and then also growing up where I did, you ran into actors, singers, dancers, models all the time. You would just see them out. You'd go to the store, they're there buying stuff. Um, I went into Gil Turner's one time, and uh, which, which was a liquor store to buy something. Um, not liquor, but, you know, candy or whatever. And I remember coming home and saying, Mom, Mom, I saw Moses today. And she said, oh, you saw Charlton Heston? <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, he was buying some liquor <laughs> in, 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 in Turner's. You know, he was, he was buying some liquor in Turner's. Um, and you, you would just see them driving around and all that. I never thought about meeting him, but the first time I actually had the premonition of meeting him was when I was driving with my girlfriend. I had uh, I was about 21 or 22, and we were driving in Hollywood, and he passed by in his one of his black studs Bearcat cars. Oh, wow. And I literally saw the car, and I thought, that is the most gorgeous car I've ever seen. And I, by this time, I, I was already used to seeing and dating celebrities and stars and working in film and television and radio and advertising. So I had had, by the time I was 21, a huge, more so than most kids, a huge history growing up in the entertainment business. So he passed by me, and our, our paths crossed, and he was going south, and I was headed north. His car crossed mine. And there was this huge bolt, and I mean a, like lightning struck you, struck you a, of energy mm-hmm. that just hit me as I was driving. And I literally, I almost passed out. And I turned to my girlfriend, Carol, and I said, Carol, I said, that was Elvis Presley. I said, I got the strangest premonition, almost like a deja vu. I'm going to know him. And I said, I'm not going to just meet him. I'm going to know this man. And she thought, oh, yeah, you're crazy as usual, and we just kept on driving. And about two and a half years later is when I met him, and uh, we started dating. So uh, I had never before had, you know, having had that premonition of passing by him like that, um, 
ever thought that I would meet him or know him, not ever. Right. Now, uh, did you ever see uh, him in concert and that before you knew him? or? Um, I did see him in concert. Um, and again, I did not have that feeling of ever going to know him, but uh-huh. he was so magical and he was so extraordinary. Um, and he, you know, he really performed more in the South. Um, right. right. Then, then, then he ever came to L.A. Um, he came to L.A. and, you know, um, he didn't do the uh, Hawaiian special uh, until I was, you know, well, uh, much older. Mm-hmm. But I, I, you know, I saw him in L.A. and um, but I didn't have that premonition. You know, when I saw him then, Joe, it was more like seeing the Beatles in concert or or these other entertainers. So I didn't have this this gnawing feeling of wanting to know him. I wasn't that kind of a kid that said, "Oh my God, I got I I've got to put all the pictures up and and I've got to meet <laughs> him somehow." You know, if anything, was it was more the Beatles at that time, right. or it was more Troy Donahue. It was more the surfer kind of thing than it was him at that time for me. Right, but he was awesome in concert. He was, and and I did go see him, um, but I wasn't as a young girl traveling uh, that time. You know, back into the southern states, I wasn't going into Texas and Alabama and Florida. Um, you know, and even though he was in New York, I was too young. I wasn't traveling back there at that age. You know, I was still in school, so the only option I had. To see him was when he came to to L.A. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Now, when was the first time that you actually met Elvis Presley? How did that come about? I met him um, when I was back in L.A. for one week. I had been living in Europe. I was living in Rome, Italy, and I was modeling and acting. And I came back to close up my apartment, and I thought, I really want to live in Europe. I, I just love Europe. I wanted to stay there. So I came back to close up my apartment for one week, and one night I went out after I first got home, and I went to a private club, which was mainly for actors and people, and the general public couldn't get in. You had to either know somebody or be a member, and I was 24 at the time. This was in March of 1975, and I went into a private club, and I'm trying to remember the name of it. It wasn't the Daisy. It wasn't the trip. It was it was on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. Gosh, I can't remember the name of it, but it'll come to me during the interview. And um, there was a guy in there that I knew that had a an agency, a lookalike agency. And he came up to me and he said, um, you know, I'd really like to invite you to, to this party, this Hollywood party. And I said, I really have no interest. I said, I'm moving I won't be here. I, I really don't care to go. And I, by that time, I'd already, like I said, seen and done more than most kids, you know, by 24 years of age. So for me, it wasn't a big deal. If you would have asked the average girl coming into town to go to a Hollywood party where there'd be celebrities and things, they'd jump at the chance. Sure. <laughs> but I don't, I'd already kind of been there, done that, you know. So I was getting ready to pack and move to Europe, and I was with other kinds of celebrities and other kinds of people in Europe and and, you know, uh, different celebrities in, in France and Italy and Barbara Boucher and, and um, you know, Ursula Andres at the time was there, Bridget Bardot was there. So these were other kind of celebrities. And um, he took my number and he called me every day and he said, look, he said, I'll be very honest with you. He said, the party's going to be held at Elvis Presley's house in Holmby Hills. And literally it hit me. It just hit me. And I thought, oh, wait a second, remember that premonition you had a couple of years ago? And he never told me that that I would meet Elvis. He never said Elvis would be there. He just said it's going to be at his home. Right. So I thought, well, okay, I'll go. You never know. You never know who will be there. So I got all dressed, and I drove to the house and uh, knocked on the door, went in the house, they sat me down, and there was nobody in the entire house but the Memphis Mafia. And they were all sitting in one room, sitting around in chairs. 
And I did not realize what was going to happen, but it was an interview. And they started interviewing me one by one and asking me, you know, who I was, where did I go to school, what did I do, what did I like, what kind of music did I like, did I have brothers and sisters, what kind of a family did I come from. This was really like an inquisition. (laughs) And I didn't, you know, I'm still very young, so I'm being very ladylike and very quiet, and I, I had no concept of what this was then. And I didn't ask any questions. You know, I'm still pretty young, 24. Sure. And trying to be very gracious and, and you know, um, I grew up very um, uh, religious and went to church and all that and was very Christian. And and so I behaved very well. I mean, I was taught as a proper young girl how to be a proper lady. And so at 24, I was. So I, I really had no idea. And then at some point, the guy started leaving, and apparently they were telling Elvis, she's okay. I didn't know Elvis was even there. Right. You know, and uh, then at some point, he stood in the doorway of the room, and that bolt of lightning just hit me again. It was just unbelievable. It was like, it was like something struck you, you know. And, and I turned to the right, and there he was standing in the doorway. And he looked at me, and he said, uh, honey... He said, sorry I'm late, but so were you. And <laughs> it just hit me. It was so funny. And I just started cracking up and laughing hysterically. He was just, just the delivery was hysterical. And then all the guys started laughing. We all were cracking up. And Elvis kind of sauntered into the room and introduced himself and held out his hand and said, uh, Hi, honey, I'm Elvis. And I looked at him and put out my hand and I said, Hi, I'm Mindy. We never stopped talking, and that's how our date started that night, and that's the relationship started, and I started traveling with him and going on tour, and and the whole evening was just remarkable, just remarkable. I what, never had a date like that in my life. What did you talk about? Well, it turned out that I had grown up the first four years of my life in Hawaii, mm-hmm. and he loved Hawaii, and I went there on many occasions to get away and loved the island people. And love the kind of lifestyle. So that was one of the first things we had in common, uh, is that I grew up there and I knew Hawaii very well. So we had that first love. Then we um, both rode, and I started riding at seven, and I was doing stunts. I did a lot of stunt work in my um, <clears throat> in my acting. I did all my own stunt work in my film, and I also doubled for a lot of other people. And did their stunt work. So we had horseback riding in common. We loved horses. We both loved animals. I had already been doing karate, Shotokan, and he had been doing karate, which he loved. So we were both, we both loved karate and the discipline of it. And I had done nunchucks, and um, he had been doing Kempo karate. Right. So he had me start taking from Ed Parker at his dojo in California and L.A. near my apartment. He had me take lessons from Ed Parker um, uh, in Kempo. And so I had already been doing hand-to-hand combat, uh, falls, tumbles, uh, jumping out of buildings. Um, We (laughs) both loved firearms. And, you know, I'm sure that was not a normal thing for his other girlfriends, but I loved firearms. And I'd already, I had firearms by the time I met him and was already shooting and practicing and uh, I had a, a World War II rifle that I bought, which I loved, which is actually illegal in California now. And then I had a little snub-nosed cobra that I loved, and we talked about guns and firearms. And uh, we, when I loved cars, he loved cars, so we talked about cars, and I had told him that um, I would had a uh, cobra racing car, and he said, how does a, a young girl like you do all this stuff? He says, you're like a guy's girl i said yeah i am and so you know i'm very much a tomboy but still very very feminine so i loved all the guy stuff that he loved that most girls don't and so you know we talked about we talked about that i talked about living in europe and traveling all my life and that was something he wanted to do more of and he talked about being able to visit paris in the army and being in v spot in germany and uh that he really wanted to go on tour and wanted to tour more, and he wanted to go into other states that he hadn't been to. 
But he wanted to really go to Australia and England, and he wanted to do free concerts for people and kids and fans that couldn't afford tickets, couldn't right. afford to come to the States and see him. So he wanted to go into South America. He told me um, there were so many places he wanted to go. So he asked me about these other countries that I had visited <clears throat> and what they were like and what the people were like, and he found that fascinating. And then we also had the love of spirituality, which is the biggest thing that bonded us. And I was always reading from my Bible, and he always read from his, so we talked a lot about that. Um, we, t- we talked a lot about spirituality, and uh, he said that he was very, very misunderstood by a lot of people, and that they, he did not, he was not able within the Memphis Mafia to really share um, with anybody right. his spirituality, because... They were guys, guys, and so they did guy things, which was great, but when he would retreat to his room or he wanted to be alone and have his alone time, he was alone with his thoughts. And this is why people will say, how could a man that was surrounded by people all the time, and I mean all the time, when he wanted to be alone, he could be. He went to his room, wherever that was in any of his houses or whenever he was on tour, but he was lonely then because the things that truly mattered to him were not shared by anybody right and so i shared those things with him from day one because that's who i was i was a very and still am to this day and this is what i talk about with him on facebook and other areas is how spiritual he was and he had the guys go out and get me books in the middle of the night they called the owner woke the owner up from the bodhi tree bookstore and my apartment was one block from the Bodhi Tree, which was my favorite bookstore. And it was Elvis's favorite bookstore at the time. And when we found that out, that was it. We were, we, that was it for us because mm. we both loved all these same things, but then the spirituality is the one thing he really needed from someone. And that is what we bonded on just over everything else that we had in common. Um, we bonded over that. And so I told him that there were certain books I had, certain books I didn't have. I said, what books do you have that I don't have? And he sent his guys out, and they came in probably two or three in the morning with all these spiritual books. And we read, and he sang to me that night, and um, we just bonded until 7 o'clock in the morning. And he wanted me to stay, and I said, Elvis, I've got to get home, you know. And he said, well, you're coming back tonight, aren't you? And I said, if you want me to. I said, but, you know, I I came back that night. And as soon as I walked in my apartment door, he called. And he didn't really pick up. He didn't. He wasn't a guy that picked up the phone and called you that often. It was the guys that called and said, Elvis needs you or Elvis wants you or, you know. Uh He had Joe Esposito do that or somebody else do that. But, I mean, he did call me. But the the first time after I got home, he called and said, uh, uh, honey, I just want to make sure you got home okay and, you know, all that. And I said, yes, I'm here. And we talked for another two or three hours. <laughs> he was still up. We talked, and he said, now you're coming back tonight. He goes, I'm going to come and pick you up now. He says, I don't want you driving here. He said, I want, I'm going to come and pick you up in the, in the limo and the whole thing. And I said, okay. And, you know, the, that night he offered me jewelry and a new car, and I turned him down. I said, no, can't take, I can't do it. I wasn't raised that way. I'm I can't take a car from you. I don't know you. And he said, well, the the back end of your Mustang is a little bashed in. And I said, yes, it is, but I'll get it fixed. And he had the guys bring out this huge box, his black box of jewelry. And he started going through his jewelry. He wanted to give me jewelry. I said, no, I don't want it. I'm not going to take it. And he was shocked. He couldn't believe it. I wonder why he did did that. Uh, And I wonder why he had to give gifts to... Did he feel that he had to give gifts to people for them to like him? Um, I don't think so, but a large part of what people don't realize about him was that he, they forget that he was so poor. They really do. They forget that he was poor, and he was a giving man, and he knew from his studies of spirituality and studies of religious belief and the way he was brought up that giving to people is what the good Lord put us here for. Mm -hmm. The good, the the Lord put us here to give to each other, to give in terms of love, of energy, of jobs, of single-mindedness, 
um, gifts of joy from your heart, gifts of all kind, not just material gifts. He bought these things not only for him, but he bought lots of joy for other people. He'd buy vats of joy from Lowell Hayes, from from all his other guys, um, to give to the ladies he would meet, to give to the men he would meet, to give to perfect strangers. You didn't have to know him. He didn't have to be in love with you for him to give you a gift or buy you a car, as we all now know. You know, right. he did that out of the goodness of his heart. He wanted to make people happy. He wanted to put a smile on people's face. Um, but he also knew, and this is what a lot of people don't realize, is that he knew in his time that what he had was worth something. So if he gave you a ring or a car or a gift, he knew that if you needed to ever sell it and you needed the money to you know, pay for your home or your child needed surgery or you needed a car or you needed something, that you could sell something of his and it would be worth something. So, it, you know, people on Facebook, a lot of people say, well, boy, I would never sell anything if he gave it to me. But if you're in dire need and you're in dire straits and you lose your job or, God forbid, your child comes down with cancer or you do or your wife, just like a lot of the guys in the Memphis Mafia did. A lot of them have had to sell things off because <clears throat> when Elvis passed away, they were out of a job immediately. Sure. They had no job to go to. Mm. And Elvis had bought them their homes, bought them their cars, given them jewelry, given them watches, all kinds of things. They tried their best to hold on to the things that Elvis gave them. But when push comes to shove, Joe, and you have nothing else of value, you're going to sell those things because you have to. Right. The ordinary person that says, I would never have sold a ring or this or that, may never find themselves in those kind of dire straits. Right. They already have a job. They have a husband. They have a wife. Maybe they have a two-income kind of job. So, gosh, Elvis Presley gives you a gift. Of course you're going to hang on to it. It was different with the guys and the girls in the group and the girlfriends. You know, And your car is only going to last you so many years. Then you, you have to be able to keep up that car. You have to be able to pay for a garage for it. Parts for it uh, aren't made 40 years later, usually. Sure. You know, those cars have been discontinued. Uh, it takes a lot of money for those cars. So most everybody does not have the car that Elvis bought. Them. They all sold it. And then he bought them a new car, and then they'd sell that. Mm. So, you know, um, it was a different thing for him for someone to say thank you but no thank you. And I think in his mind... It showed him that I was not there to misuse or abuse him. I was not there to get what I could from him. Right. You know, I didn't bring my family or my mother or my father or anybody into the picture to get them employed or to get them gifts or to get him to buy them a house or to take them on tour. That was, you know, if I was going to get to know him, it was going to be he and I. I wasn't bringing anybody else into that. I wanted to show him that I was there for him, that I loved him, that he was my boyfriend. I was not there to misuse or abuse him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. No. And I said, I said to him later on, I said, you know, if, if the relationship becomes something and it's more than friendship and we become intimate and we become a boyfriend and a girlfriend and I travel and I do things with you, then it becomes a different scenario. But on a first night... I'm not there to take from you. No way. Uh-uh. Right. Now, you were a so, girl. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, so I think I think in that way it showed him from day one that I wasn't there for any other reason than to be a friend, a real friend, you know? Right. Now, you were a girlfriend from 75 to 77, so I have to ask, he had other girlfriends during that time. Did you realize that? Did you realize I did not. Okay. No, I did not. Not in the beginning. And when I when I met him, and this one particular person had gone back to the Memphis Mafia, because apparently what they did is they had people like, um, they had uh, George Klein, you mm -hmm. know, in Memphis, who knew Elvis's taste in ladies. And so, you know, he was always on the lookout. Uh, because Elvis could not just go out and just date somebody. He couldn't go to a club or, you know, the normal way of, of an entertainer of his caliber and, and just meet somebody. So he basically had to 
kind of have feelers out by the guys and knowing this is what I like. Right. You know, this is this is my taste in women. You know, most guys have a certain taste. You know, they like a certain kind of woman or they may meet somebody and didn't necessarily have to be blonde or brunette, but if you got along with them and you liked him, you started dating him. He didn't have the wherewithal to just do that. It wasn't that easy for him as he was older. When he was younger, yes, he could meet people in a more normal way. But by the time I met him in 75, two years prior to his passing away, he couldn't just go out and just meet anybody. He couldn't do it. So he had to have women brought to him. And the first night after we met, uh, and then the second night, I was told by the guys that uh, his girlfriend, he had broken up with. Okay. Well, I didn't know who his girlfriend was at the time, and I was told it was Linda. So I had assumed that he and Linda had broken up. I didn't know any better. Had I known he had other girlfriends at the time, I probably would not have dated him because I would not have wanted to be one of many. And as most women want to, you want to be exclusive. You want to feel that you're with one person and he's with one person. But I also wasn't stupid, you know. And I knew that from being in the entertainment industry that uh, entertainers usually have more than one lady because they travel, they're in different cities, they've got one in every port. So, you know, as time went on, I learned that there were other women uh, and that there was never just one woman. There was never just one woman when he was married, before, during, or after. And he wasn't that kind of a guy. He loved women. And he, he was not just dating one woman at any time. I mean, he always had ladies. That was just who he was. He loved women, he respected women, and as I got to know that, it was either you stay in the relationship understanding there are going to be other ladies, or you don't, Right. you know, and so I chose to, and I also understood from talking to him afterward that he traveled a lot, and he didn't always want to take the same lady with him on tour. He wanted a variation of women. He did, and I, you know... I can't sit here and say there's anything wrong with it. I think most men like a variation of women. I think it's just in the male um, makeup, you know, that men like women. They they like a variation, and I can't put that down. I get it. I understand it, especially as a as an older woman now. I get it, you know. <laughs> right. It, it was harder to get it when you were younger, but I got it at a very early age. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you, yeah. let me ask you, were you ever told that things had to stay uh, within the group that you were, you're not allowed to go out and, and say what Elvis is doing and blah, 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 blah. Did somebody, act, or did Elvis ever say to you, everything needs to be kept on the up and up? Yes, he did all the time. And so did the guys. Um, when you were brought into this group and you were made a girlfriend, not just somebody he dated a couple of times, but when you were at his homes, either in Graceland or California or wherever he was, and you went on tour and you were in the hotels and he confided in you, you were considered a girlfriend. Um, whether that girlfriend was for two months or two years or 20 years, you were considered a girlfriend. And you were told by him and by the guys, that there was a certain protocol that you had to follow. And that protocol was that you don't talk about him, you don't give interviews about him, you don't write books about him, uh, you don't promote whatever you're doing at the time uh, by, you know, you misusing or abusing his name. Right. You are respectful of this man, and you keep your relationship with him private. If there was a picture taken of you and it got out, then it got out. But that was a candid shot. Therefore, any pictures I have are candid. I never once asked anyone to take a picture of Elvis and I, ever. I understood from, a, from very early on that you just didn't do it. Now, he had pictures with complete strangers because they wanted a picture and they were fans. Sure. So there are people that got lucky that got pictures with him with his arm around him and this and that. Um, when you see pictures of him with his other girlfriends, a lot of the time they were taken by other family members, um, you know, or they were taken by other people um, at a time where he didn't mind a picture being taken or it was a private thing. 
at that time, he didn't really think that these pictures, all these pictures, were going to be out, you know, of him and all these ladies. And seeing other women at the time, he didn't want the other women to know he was dating the other women. Sure. So there was purposely never a picture taken of he and I because Linda was still in the picture. There were other women in the picture. He didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Um, and Grayson, he didn't have pictures up of his ex-wife. He didn't have pictures up of other girlfriends. They were all taken down if there was another girlfriend there and maybe put back up. I don't know. Yeah. But they were never in the house, so I never saw any other pictures of anybody else. And you were very respectful of him and his time. You didn't talk about things. You didn't. I didn't ever tell anybody I was dating him. I had to tell my modeling agent and my acting agent that I was dating him because they had to know because I was booking out. I wasn't available for jobs because we were on tour together or I was accompanying him somewhere. So they had to know, but I said, don't dare talk. I said, you cannot be telling the press or anybody that one of the models in your stable is dating him. I well, said, please don't. I, I said, because I'll get in trouble. And they said, whoa, Mindy, we would, we would never. So, you know, for almost 40 years, I've never spoken about it. Very, very, very rarely. Yeah. Now, did you get along with the uh, guys in the Memphis Mafia? I loved every one of them that I met. Now, I did not meet um, Marty Lacker. He was not around by then. Um, there were quite a few people I did not get to meet that were just weren't around when I was there, you know. Um, but the main guys I did, Sonny, Red, Dave Hepler, uh, Al Strada became a very good friend of mine. Um, Joyce Bezito became a very good friend of mine. I hung out with him and his girlfriend at the time, all the time, from the time I started dating Elvis. Um, and then even after he passed away, we all were still very good friends. Um, they were always gentlemen. They were always respectful. They were always lovely to me. Um, I can't say, there's not a negative thing about him I can say. Um, you know, I do know that Elvis wasn't happy that the book was written, right? and uh, the guys were fired from it. But I also know that Elvis was the most forgiving man in the world, and he forgave them as he forgave everyone, because this is how he was brought up. You know, you might be angry, and he was, and he ranted and raved to me on many, many occasions and didn't know what to do and would his fans still love him. But I can honestly say that he forgave them, and, you know, before he passed away, he spoke to Red, he spoke to Sonny, he spoke to the guys. He didn't have to speak to them ever again, but he chose to. He wanted to. He already had forgiven them. And people today that hold grudges against these people uh, are living 40 years in the past. Sure. You've got to move forward and you've got to forgive in your heart. And if you really knew Elvis, then you knew that that's what he would have wanted you to do. If you didn't really know him, and you're still running around holding grudges against these people. Elvis was was love uh, completely. He stood for nothing but love. And, you know, his mother's middle name, Gladys, was love. I often think that Elvis's middle name should have been love. Elvis loved Presley, like his, like his mama. But <clears throat> he was the most loving, forgiving man, Joe, and uh, he would never harbor any kind of hostility towards anybody. He might say privately that he was angry, but uh, publicly he would never show that way. He was that way after his divorce. He always made the best of things, and um, he moved on, and he always had wonderful women in his life for the most part. And um, that's who he was, yeah. you know. Did he ever talk to you about his mother? He did. He did. And um, he always told me that he had always been attracted to women that reminded him of his mother. <clears throat> so he was always very attracted to brunettes. Um, he liked brunettes more than, I mean, he had blonde girlfriends, but he liked brunettes more than anything and dark eyes like his mom. And uh, he liked the women in his life to have some spirituality and... Uh, be very uh, Bible read and believe in the Lord, and his mother had brought him up very, 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 very well. And um, he missed her immensely. He went to her gravesite a lot and sat and talked with her a lot. And he said that he talked with her privately 
uh, when he did not have a lady around, he would talk to her. Mm. And um, he was a mama's boy, but not in the worst sense of the word. He was a mama's boy in the sense that he told me he loved and he respected her, and that's why he always loved and respected women. Right. And I and I firmly believe, and I even asked him, I said, do you think, you know, you respect women today because of the love that you had for your mother? And he said, yes, very much so. But he was a very, very private man, very, very private. And um, even in his interviews, you see in a lot of his old interviews, He's kind of shucking and jiving, and when you ask him about a girlfriend or you ask him about his mother, he kind of hems and haws around it. He never directly really put it out there. He said, well, there's nobody special right now, but if there were, he wasn't going to talk about it. And, you know, when it came to talking about his mom and dad, he would answer very curtly and move on to the next question, just like he would politically. He had his own political views, but he did not discuss it. So. You know, even in private, he he was very, very, very private. He um, talked about uh, certain people in his life, and I have never talked about them. I don't mention them. I know the good and the bad about them, but it's not for me to say. It's not what he would have wanted, and I have to still walk that line and respect him. And he asked me never to write a book about him. I never did, never have. Um I was told never to speak about certain people he told me about, which mm-hmm. I never have. Um, and I honor that. I respect him to this day, you know. Yeah, I have to admit, I mean, when I uh, first saw a Facebook page with you, I-, I had no idea who you were. I mean, you really did stay out of the Elvis world for years. I did. And the only reason I came in it is because uh, a friend of mine at the time um, decided that she would put up a little kind of picture of he and I coming off uh, one of the planes Mm -hmm. from tour. And she put it up there on her Facebook page. And she said, I want to introduce you to my friend, Mindy Miller. She dated Elvis and um, you're going to be hearing a lot more about her. And then she literally called me and told me she did it. And I said, why? I wasn't mad or angry at her. You know, I loved her. I, didn't wasn't angry but I said you know I've never spoken I said um I said only maybe two or three interviews my entire life and they were from England and they were very small short interviews Mm -hmm. um Life Magazine had done um a big article on Elvis and they had done an article about me and one of the main last girlfriends that shall remain nameless in 77 Mm -hmm. and so there were pictures of me and her uh, in that Life magazine, which is a very big article, um, done without my say-so, done without my knowledge. Um, and, of course, I went to an attorney, and I said, can they do that? I said, I didn't give that. And, he, they, she, and the attorney said, well, you're a public figure because right. you're associated with a major public figure, so anybody can print a story with you in it. They don't have to get your permission. And I said, wow, because I never knew that. And so, uh, you know, the story was written up, and I was in there, and this other gal was in there. And um, so, you know, a lot of this was news to me. I had never known that there were pictures. I never knew. Joe, for 40 years, I never knew there was a picture of Elvis and I. Really? Never. For 40 years? I never, no, never knew it, never saw one. I I never was on Facebook before last year at this time. I only came on Facebook last year at this time. I had never written a book, I'd, and you know, in all these 39 years of his passing, it will be 40 next year, hundreds of books came out about him. I was shocked. I had no idea. Uh, books came out from the nurses, the maids, the cooks, yeah. the ex-wife, the girlfriends, the friends who dated friends. Yeah. Everybody, <laughs> but the, everybody but the electrician. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I was like, wow, I had no idea. Yeah. Or did I ever read these books? I never read one book. You know, I've only now started to read a few, um, but I had no idea. So, um, you know, this friend at the time said, well, you need to go on Facebook. You need to talk about it. And I said, well, why would you put me out there? I was, I'm very curious. And she said, well, because you really dated him and you really did know him and you were intimate with him and you knew him. And she said, so many people are coming on Facebook, and they talk like they know him. 
Yeah. And they talk about things they don't know anything about. And she said, there aren't a lot of us left yeah. that can really tell it like it is, that can really say, this is the truth and what you're saying is wrong. Yeah. And and she said, you know, uh, you need to help lift his legacy in the right way. And I said, well, then I'll do it. But you see, I still wouldn't talk about certain things, which I still don't talk about. I would never talk about medications. I would never talk about any of that kind of stuff. And so when I started going out there, the fans, you know, started coming to me and saying, well, we don't think you're real. We've yeah. never heard of you, and, you know, and yeah. and you're, you must be lying like everybody else that says you dated him. Right. And then the pictures started coming out, and then the slowly by, but surely people started interviewing me, and then they would talk to some of the guys and say, was there really a Mindy Miller that dated this guy? And they said, yes, there really was. Yep. Um, and so slowly it happened. And so um, slowly the interview started. And then the Essential Elvis magazine invited me to come to England to meet his fans and mm-hmm. talk to them, which I did in July. And we did a big, big article, part one and part two, in the Essential Elvis magazine. Yep. And, um, you know, I told everybody about who he was and who I was. And then recently I've been invited to come to Denmark. Wow. So we'll see if that works out to come to see the Danish Elvis fans. And I would love to travel and talk about the Elvis that I knew, the spiritual Elvis. I'm not there to talk about anything negative, anything that is going to downgrade him. I'm only here to lift up his legacy as a man that I love, that I knew, um, that treated me, you know, with gold, like he treated everyone. Um, because, Joe, everybody is dying in the Elvis circle. Yeah. There are very few people left. We just lost Joe Esposito. We lost Joe Gershio. We've lost Charlie Hodge. Um, Al Strada, who is a wonderful man, uh, does not speak about Elvis, will not speak about him. And I honor him. He is my modern-day hero, and he keeps quiet. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we've lost a lot of people because they're getting into their 70s and 80s now. And the the girlfriends are the only ones that are left that, and when I say the girlfriends, I mean the girlfriends that really were around him, that knew him, not some that had a couple of dates like Sybil Shepherd or Natalie Wood or sure. yeah. people here and there that went out on two dates or spent a weekend with him. Um, and so there are very few of us and far between. And... The sad thing is that a lot of the books have been embellished also. And um, the only thing that's going to be left for the upcoming population of people that love this man and the kids that are kids today that love him, they're only going to have his movies, which don't tell you who he was. They're only going to have his music, which don't tell you who he was. They'll tell you these are the movies he did. These are the songs he sang. Here are, you know, this is why he loved gospel more than anything. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to share with you who he was really as a human being. Right. This is the man. This is the man. I don't profess to know every single jumpsuit Mm -hmm. that he wore on such and such a day. You can go to Google and, and anybody can find out that. You can find out, pick a date, what city he was in, what plane he flew in. Uh, you know, whether it was the Lisa Marie or it was one of his other planes, you can find out all kinds of artifacts about him. But there's nobody left, hardly, to tell you who he yeah, was. You're right. What was he really like? Who was this man? Why did he think the way he thought? Why did he believe in Taoism? Why did he believe in Confucius? Why did he read Buddhist? Why did was he reading Zen? Why was he... Why was he asking these eternal life questions that that he could not discuss with anybody? So his fans finally came to me and said, Mindy, we want you to talk. We want you to write. We want to hear from you the Elvis that you knew. The Elvis that somebody else knew might be a different Elvis because he was with different people. Right. Different okay. people. Are you are you the same with everybody you know? No. Am I the same with everybody I know? Do I love my mother the same as I love my boyfriend? Do I love my nephew the same as I love my brother? Do I love this girlfriend the same way I love that girlfriend? No. 
Right. We all love differently. The same way Elvis Presley loved each girlfriend differently. He loved each guy differently. He loved each family member differently. But he loved them all. That's what's important, you know, to get across to people. So they said, we believe that this is your time to talk. And this is your time to share with the fans what we don't know about him. Right, I agree, Mindy. And, Mindy. What we, and, and what we've never heard before about him. Right, Mindy, I want to take a little break here, okay? Okay. Okay. The ground, like gold of autumn leaves around my feet. I touch them and they burst apart with sweet memories. Sweet memories. Of holding hands and red bouquets And twilights trimmed in purple haze And laughing eyes and simple ways And quiet nights and gentle days with you Memories press between the pages of my mind Memories through the ages just like one Memories Memories Of holding hands and red bouquets And twilights trimmed in purple haze And laughing eyes and simple ways And quiet nights and gentle days with you You've been listening to Elvis Express Radio and Joe Crine talking with the wonderful Mindy Miller. Part two of this interview will continue right here on Elvis Express Radio next week. Memories sweetened through the ages just like wine. Memories. Memories. Memories Memories